Well, hi there, my friends. How's it going? Welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build and play a character in the hopes of creating something that is both really powerful, but also really fun to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game itself, or you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build a character that you're thinking about playing in your next campaign, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am so glad you're here. So thanks for showing up. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. I know we're gonna go over today. I can just feel it, judging by the length of my script. So let's just jump right in. As most of you know, I'm not a huge fan of trying to recreate third-party fictional characters to be played in D&D. It can be a fun exercise. I did it once with the Windrunner, the Kaladin Storm-Blessed build off of uh, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive, some of my favorite novels. But generally speaking, and as I explained in that video, trying to do that often feels like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, and I don't love it. Preferring instead to create my own characters with their own story in a way that doesn't feel like a bit ham-fisted. But despite that fact, I still get a lot of requests to recreate third-party fictional characters for play in D&D. I probably always will, and that's okay. But the one that I get the most often, and was definitely the first one that I ever received, was to do Aang from The Last Airbender. Hence the Aang shirt today. Oh, look at him in all his majesty. Fair warning, in case you just got really excited. <laughs> I am not going to be trying to recreate Aang from The Last Airbender with this video today. That said, I'm definitely not averse to the idea of maybe creating something that's sort of inspired by third-party fiction. And if you want to take that and tweak it to make it work for your avatar world, then by all means, go for it. Because, yeah, the build today is basically inspired by an avatar-like character. Why? Because it's a way of the four elements monk. <laughs> Say what now? <laughs> that's right. I'm going to undertake perhaps my most difficult feat of strength to date. Create a Way of Four Elements monk that's viable and maybe even kinda good. Whew, that's a tall order. Now, for the uninitiated, you might be wondering why I'm acting like pulling this off would be a huge flex. Without spending too much time digging into the weeds of why, I'll just say that I think monks, though they are my favorite class in the game, conceptually at least, tend to be pretty dang lackluster when it comes to mechanical power in D&D 5e. And of all the subclasses available to monks, the way of the four elements is often bemoaned as one of the worst subclasses you could take. The reasons for this are varied, but in a nutshell, I think it boils down to this. While they do get some spells and spell-like abilities, and that's nice, spells are always good to have in D&D, the spells Way of the Four Elements monks get access to are very limited, very expensive, and don't necessarily innately, inherently synergize all that well with other monk features and abilities. And yet, one of my most oft subclass build requests that I get from my viewers is to do a Way of the Four Elements monk. And you know what? I get it. I mean, being both a martial artist and having the ability to harness the power of the elements to augment your attacks, move or control enemies, or even float on the wind is a super compelling character concept that has all kinds of precedent in popular culture too, right? And hey, most of you know that one of my favorite things to try and do on this channel is to take a thing that is often seen as underpowered, whether it be a subclass like the Artillerist Artificer, or a weapon like the Dart, or the Light Hammer, and to try and create a build around it in a way that's fun and interesting, but also viable if not powerful, so I have been wanting to take a stab at building a Four Elements monk for a long time now, and today is finally the day that I make the attempt. But yeah, it's not going to be easy. Monks already scale poorly damage-wise, and especially because their abilities all tend to cost a lot of key points, of which we have too small a pool, in my opinion, I think we're going to have to build this character for burst or nova damage, meaning that they'll be intentionally spending a lot of resources to get one big round of burst damage in an attempt to totally eliminate one enemy 
early on in the combat encounter to swing the odds in their party's favor right from the start. So for this build, I'm going to have one rule that I'm giving myself and one goal. The rule is I can never have more levels in any other character class than I do in monk levels. So, okay, here's the caveat. To be fair, calling this build a Way of the Four Elements monk character build might be a little generous and or misleading. But we will start in monk, and we will never have more levels in any other class than we do in monk. So in that sense, it will definitely be a monk at its core, at its nucleus. And I really am going to do my best to also stick to the theme and the concept of playing this avatar like monkish bender of the elements throughout the character build. Come on guys, this subclass is really bad mechanically. You gotta throw me this bone here. As for my goal, it is to create a character who is not dead last on my spreadsheets for burst damage. For those who don't know, check in the video description, I always put a link to graphs and spreadsheets comparing all the other, in this case, burst damage or Nova damage builds that I've done to date so that you can see how they kind of stack up to one another. I know not being dead last probably sounds like a low bar to be setting, but believe me, it's still not very easy to reach here. <laughs> all right. You think I can do it? Let's find out. I proudly present episode number 124, The Way of Four Elements Monk. Or actually, I don't know if I feel comfortable giving it that title because of all the multiclassing we'll be doing. Let's just call it The Four Elements Avatar. Yeah. I like that a little better. Huge thanks to my big friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he came up with for this character. I love it. He's so on point every time I send him these concepts every week. He comes up with this amazing artwork for each one of them. If you would like to follow Randall on social media to check out the other stuff he's done or to potentially commission him to create some art for your character or your party, I will as always put links in the video description so that you can do so. Thanks, Randall. And also, really quick, before we jump into the build, I want to tell you guys about a new sponsor for the video this week. It's a new D&D supplementary book made by Coven Games called Out of the Maw. Out of the Maw is chock full of fantastic additional material that you can include in your D&D adventure, including a ton of new creepy creatures, 23 of which are aberrations, for those of you who are into that. They range from challenge rating one quarter all the way up to challenge rating 30. 30. There are magnificent magic items, including really powerful corrupted weapons that players can obtain and then go through the work of trying to purify in order to remove their curse, a slew of new spells, two, yes, two new adventures, one for low-level characters and then one for high-level characters, new random encounter tables, and amazing artwork, as you can tell, all of which is designed around an entity from beyond the stars known as the Hungering Maw. The thing in the book that I'm the most interested in, of course, is the new Warlock subclass that they create. It's called the Warlock of the Ever-Changing One. This warlock takes on some of the ever-changing nature of their patron, gaining the ability to alter their body and adapt to their surroundings. Sounds super cool. And guess what? Out of the Maw launches on Kickstarter to a day. That's January 10th of 2023 for those watching after release date. So you guys should totally go check it out. I will of course put a link in the video description on how to do so. And please use that link so that they know I sent you. Back this project now because as you all know, backing a project while it's in Kickstarter always gets you access to goodies that you often can't get otherwise if you wait until it's published to purchase it, right? Things like access to the Discord server, options to get electronic versions of the book, and even the ability to play test the second campaign that they're doing, the high level campaign, that the lead writer of the book himself, Chris, will be hosting for five generous Kickstarter backers before the final version of the adventure gets added to the book. So don't delay, this book looks both creepy and f this book looks creepy and fun and gorgeous, and I really hope that you'll give them your support. So, big thanks to Coven Games, good luck with the Kickstarter, and let's jump into the build. Alright, 
At level one, for our starting class, yes, we're going to start off as a monk. I'm sticking to my guns here, and I'm definitely leaning into the aesthetic and the concept, going for a live, wise, unarmored martial artist. This particular hero happens to be very in tune with the natural world and the elements of nature that surround us. Yes, I do mean water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Sorry, what was I talking about? Right, monks. That's us. A nature-loving, elementally attuned monk. As for our race, there's not really a feat that I feel is a must-have on this character, hence I'm going to forego the usual variant human or custom lineage option, but we will be incredibly stat-hungry. Monks gain so much from having both a high wisdom and a high dexterity, and there's only one racial option in 5e currently that lets us add a plus two to two ability score of your choice, so I'm going to recommend that we play that class here and go with Mountain Dwarf. The fact that all dwarves get some nice weapon proficiencies that we can take advantage of really helps cement them as my number one pick here too. As for our ability scores then, I assume as always that we're going with the point by method and would suggest taking a 15 in dexterity and one of our plus twos there, a 15 in wisdom and our other plus two there, giving us a 17 in both, and then a 14 constitution. Starting off with three solid scores in the three stats that are most important for monks and the most important saving throws for all characters in game really, feels really nice. As for our equipment, you don't really need much as a monk. Kind of the blessing and the curse, right? So I'm gonna say go ahead and take the gold buy route, but really all we need here is a quarter staff, which we'll be using early on, and then also either a war hammer or a battle axe, which we will be using for most of our character's career. And yeah, all dwarves have proficiency in both of those weapons, which is fantastic because monks otherwise wouldn't. So go ahead and grab one or the other, and then put the rest of your money into the stock market because the market is down. And being the wise monk that you are, you're buying low and selling high, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Making sound investment strategies feels particularly anti-monkish, I suppose. Anyway, as a monk one, we get the unarmored defense feature, which tells us that our armor class equals 10 plus our wisdom and dexterity modifiers if we're not wearing armor or using a shield. That means we've got a 16 armor class at the moment with nothing on but our gi. Or is it G? I think it's gi. That's not bad. We also get the martial arts feature, which tells us that so long as we aren't wearing armor or using a shield again, and are using only unarmed strikes or monk weapons to attack, which typically are short swords and simple weapons without the heavy or two-handed property, but that'll change in a little bit, we can use dexterity instead of strength to roll our plus to hit and damage with weapon attacks and unarmed strikes. We can also roll our martial arts die for damage with our unarmed strikes. That's a d4 for now, but it scales with monk levels. And when we take the attack action, we can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action. All nice features to have that we will take advantage of both on our Nova and non-Nova rounds. At level two, we get key. If you think monks usually don't have enough key to do all of the things that they want to do with it, just wait until you see the wave for elements. <laughs> with key, we get one key point per monk level which reset on a short rest. Right now we can use them to do three things, patient defense and step of the wind. Let us spend a key point to take the dodge or dash actions as bonus actions respectively. And flurry of blows, which lets us make two unarmed strikes with our bonus action when we take the attack action instead of the usual one that monks otherwise get. So yeah, the first few levels of our career, this is going to be our Nova round. Spend a key point to make three attacks per turn, right? A regular attack and two unarmed strikes. And that's not terrible burst damage for early game. We also at monk two get unarmored movement. This tells us that, again, when we're wearing no armor or using a shield, we get an extra 10 feet of move speed. More move speed is always good, and we are likely to be particularly sensitive to positioning, at least later on in our career. So for us, it's maybe even a little better than for most characters. Finally, at Monk 2, we get the dedicated weapon feature. It tells us that after a rest, we can touch a weapon, and so long as it doesn't have the heavy or the special properties, 
it can become a monk weapon for us. Now that means we can ditch our quarterstaff and start using our warhammer or battle axe for damage. And since both of those weapons are versatile, we can use two hands when we attack with them, making the damage die a d10. And you know, that's kind of nice. Admittedly, a Warhammer wielding monk doesn't really fit the stereotype that I think most of us have when we think monks, let alone a battle axe, particularly Aang like avatar monks. But hey, nothing wrong with being unique. And if you'd really rather stick to the quarterstaff for thematic and aesthetic purposes, they're versatile as well, and you could do a d8 of damage instead of a d10. Not a huge difference. At level three, monks get deflect missiles, which tells us that when we're hit by a ranged weapon attack, we can use our reaction to reduce the damage that it does by 1d10 plus our dex modifier plus our monk level, which should reduce most ranged weapon attacks to zero, especially at this level. And that's awesome. We could also spend a key point to redirect that missile and make a weapon attack with it using our martial arts die for damage and our dexterity modifier. Not a horrible option if you really need to do a little bit more damage to something with your reaction and a key point, hopefully to finish them off so that they die and don't get any more turns, right? And then yes, we get our monastic tradition, our monk subclass here at level three. And as I've said, we are going with the way of the four elements. Since I've never used them before, let's read what Wizards of the Coast has to say about this particular subclass. You follow a monastic tradition that teaches you to harness the elements. When you focus your key, you can align yourself with the forces of creation and bend the four elements to your will, using them as an extension of your body. Some members of this tradition dedicate themselves to a single element, but others weave the elements together. If they are the avatar, anyway, right? Many monks of this tradition tattoo their bodies with representations of their key powers, commonly imagined as coiling dragons, but also as phoenixes, fish, plants, mountains, and cresting waves. Or maybe just arrows? Perfectly on point with the theme and the concept that we're going for here. So, as a Way of the Four Elements monk, we get just one single feature throughout our career, actually. It's called Disciple of the Elements. It makes me a little sad that they didn't build in some additional features here. I feel like they could have done quite a bit more to add at least some flavor to the subclass, if not a little mechanical power as you took more levels. But I guess Wizards of the Coast's thinking was the spells that this one feature gives you, of which you get more and better options as you level was sufficient. So yes, with Disciple of the Elements, we're told that we get to learn two elemental disciplines, one of which must be the Elemental Attunement Discipline, which we'll discuss in a second. We learn additional disciplines at 6th, 11th, and 17th level. You can also swap out an old discipline for a new one at those levels. Now, many of those disciplines are just renamed spells. But regardless, most of them can be upcast for additional key points. But the amount of key we get to spend, and I put that in air quotes very intentionally here, is capped based on our monk level. For now, we can't upcast any of them, but at level five, we'll be able to spend three key points to upcast something. At level nine, we could spend up to four, etc. As for those elemental disciplines, like I said, we have to take elemental attunement, which is basically like the Way of the Four Elements version of prestidigitation or maybe thaumaturgy. It lets us use our action to control elemental forces within 30 feet of us, doing things like creating a shower of sparks or a rumble of the earth, light or snuff out a candle, form a one foot shape made out of the elements, etc. It'll be cool for show and maybe a little utility, but not much else. As for the other elemental discipline that we should take, I'm gonna say go with Water Whip. Water Whip is one of the only ones that doesn't just take an existing spell and rename it for monk purposes, but is a pretty unique thing unto itself. And you know what? It's actually decently powerful. We spend two key points with our action to create a whip of water. We target one creature with this whip and then force them to make a dexterity saving throw. If they fail, they take 3d10 bludgeoning damage. All right, not bad. Plus 1d10 more for every additional key point we spend to upcast it, which again, we can't start doing until fifth level, right? But then if they fail the save, we can either knock them prone or pull them up to 25 feet towards us. 25 feet, eh? That's 
quite a bit of forced enemy movement. The other option I would consider here if you don't love Water Whip would be the Fist of Unbroken Air. It has a similar cost and effect. It also does 3d10 bludgeoning damage, but it only moves the enemy 20 feet, and it's a push, not a pull. But also, the enemy is just automatically knocked prone if they fail their save and pushed. You don't choose move them or knock them prone, like with Water Whip. And yeah, prone and forced movement is huge and pretty unique, actually, in d d 5e. Now, one downside to the fist versus the water whip is that it allows for an enemy strength save to take half the damage and avoid being moved and knocked prone. And on average, enemies in 5e have better bonuses to their strength saving throw than their deck saving throw. My initial plan was to go with the fist because you get both prone and movement, but I think it'll make sense why I prefer water whip in addition to just the better saving throw for us to be targeting as we get further into the build. Also, as a monk level 3, we do get the key fueled attack feature, and this is an important feature for this build that Tasha's Cauldron of Everything added. It tells us that if we spend key as part of our action, then we can make one attack with either an unarmed strike or a monk weapon as a bonus action. This is a big deal because, remember, using our water whip is not taking the attack action, and thus would not trigger our martial arts unarmed strike with our bonus action, let alone flurry of blows. Now, we can get a weaponized bonus action attack even if we didn't take the attack action, so long as we're spending key with our action, like when we use water whip and we will be taking advantage of this later on in our career. Now, at level four, it's time to start our multi-classing journey, I think. You might think that's crazy. We should at least be waiting until monk five to get extra attack, right? Maybe. I mean, extra attack is important for our sustained damage, no question, but I've said I'm building this character for burst damage, and so I need to get those Nova round numbers as high as possible, especially if I want to meet my goal of not being dead last on the spreadsheet. Right now, the best way to do that is with a multi-class detour. If you'd prefer to delay that detour until after Monk 5, you go right ahead. For the rest of us, at this level, our avatar-like character is wanting to take a little break from their mystical and spiritual and bending training to focus on their martial prowess a little more. Perhaps they found themselves in a situation where their elemental bending powers were stunted or taken away, their chi was blocked or something, right? And realized that they weren't quite as proficient in their hand-to-hand -hand and weapon combat techniques as they would like to be, and thus dedicate themselves now for a time to better hone those skills. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are taking some fighter levels now. And thus, as a fighter one, we get second wind, which tells us that once per short rest, we can, with a bonus action, heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter levels. We also get a fighting style. And I'm gonna recommend we take the dueling fighting style here. It gives us a plus two to our weapon damage when we attack with a weapon we're holding in one hand and have no other weapon in our other hand. Now, we've been using our war hammer with two hands for a d10 of damage. If we wanted to benefit from dueling, we would have to switch this to be just making a one-handed attack, but still a 1d8 plus 2 damage is a little bit better than a d10, so we'll take that bump, even if it's a small one. At level 5, we would be a fighter 2, and that means we get one of the main reasons that we took fighter levels in the first place, as I'm sure many of you have guessed. Yes, action surge. And this, of course, lets us, once per short rest, take two actions on our turn instead of one. This is going to make our burst damage round a lot stronger. But it gets even better at level six because we would be a fighter three, and that means we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. And I'm gonna say we ought to go with Battlemaster, one of my favorite fighter subclasses, and I really hope they take some of the cool combat maneuvers that battle masters get and just find a way to work them into like all of the warrior types in the upcoming 1D and D. Here's hoping. But yes, battle masters just bring a lot of potential utility and even support, but mostly for our purposes, burst damage options 
to the table with their combat superiority feature, which tells us that we get to learn three maneuvers which we fuel with superiority dice. We have four superiority dice, they're d8s, they reset on a short rest, so four times per short rest, we can use one of these dice to fuel our maneuvers, right? As to which maneuvers we should learn, I love all of them, honestly, but the two I'm going to say we absolutely have to have for this build are pushing attack and trip attack. Pushing attack tells us that when we hit a creature with a weapon attack, if they are large size or smaller, they have to make a saving throw against what will be our dexterity based DC. And if they fail, we push them up to 15 feet away from us. More forced enemy movement. I can't get enough. We'll especially be making use of this later in the build. We also add our superiority die in damage when we use pushing attack, right? Similar to tripping attack. When we hit with an attack, we force a large or smaller enemy to make a saving throw, and if they fail, they're knocked prone. We similarly add the d8 of damage when we hit. And so, yes, if we aren't knocking our enemy prone with water whip, we can with this. And of course, prone is great in that it means if we're making an attack against a prone enemy from only five feet away, we have advantage on the attacks, right? All right, at level six, it is time for our first damage report. This is how I envision combat working for us at the moment. Right on round one, we are in Nova mode. We'll run up to an enemy and we will water whip them to deal damage and knock them prone. Obviously, if you can't get within range to make follow-up melee attacks on this turn, then go ahead and water whip and pull them, right? At that point, we action surge, taking the attack action to hit them with our warhammer, and yeah, using dexterity as our attack modifier, which feels a little funny for a warhammer, but I mean, it is a monk weapon, so we can do it. I guess we're just hitting them with that warhammer in exactly the right spot, right? We're going to add a maneuver to that attack, trip attack if they're not already prone from water whip, or something else like menacing attack if they are. So that lets us add a d8 of damage to the attack. And at that point, since we took the attack action, we would use flurry of blows with our third and yeah, final key point, making two unarmed strikes for a d4 of damage each, but then adding, yes, another d8 to each of them for a superiority die fuel maneuver of your choice. And yes, as a reminder, unarmed strikes are considered weapon attacks and thus we can apply Battlemaster maneuvers to them. Now, I'm not saying it's really smart to burn all of our key and most of our superiority dice in one single round of combat like this, but hey, at least we get both of those things back on a short rest, right? And this is kind of what burst damage builds do. Blow lots of resources in an attempt to take an enemy out of the fight from the get-go. And yeah, this truly is right from the get-go since we have zero setup here. You just run in, water whip, and start pummeling. I love it. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their dexterity saving throw, we would on average do 49 damage here. And against an enemy with a 15 teen armor class and a plus five to their deck save, which at this level you're almost never going to see, will do 42 damage on average. All right, my stated goal was to do a build with the core of the four elements monk that wasn't dead last for damage compared to the other Nova damage builds that I've done to date, right? Well, so far so good. This puts us about the middle of the pack for tier three compared to those other Nova builds. So not amazing, but definitely not dead last. Not bad, little Four Elements Monk. Let's see if we can keep it up. At level seven, let's grab a couple more Monk levels here to get to extra attack, increase our key, and make us feel like we're actually still a Monk and not just a character with a Monk dip, yeah? So as a Monk four, we get our first ability score increase for feet, and I wanna take a plus one to wisdom and a plus one to dexterity, giving us an 18 in each. Raising both of those ability scores is definitely the best thing we can do for our damage right now. Increasing not only our chance to hit and damage, but more importantly, reducing the enemy's chance to save against our water whip and our maneuvers. And of course, this also bumps our armor class by two, so it's a total no-brainer. We also, at Monk 4, get Slow Fall. It lets you use your reaction to reduce any fall damage against yourself by five times your monk level, and since we take 1d6 for every 10 feet we fall, that means we can fall 50 to 60 feet on average and take zero damage. And especially on this character, who could be like slowing 
having their falls with gusts of wind and things like that, right? It's perfectly on point. At level eight, we would be a monk five, and yes, we finally get extra attack. This is going to be good both for our Nova round and of course, when we're not using water whip and instead just hitting things, it'll be great for our sustained damage too. Two attacks instead of one when we take the attack action. We also get stunning strike. That fantastic and often frustrating monk feature. It's amazing in that it allows us to spend a key point when we hit an enemy with a weapon attack, again, including unarmed strikes, to force them to make a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, they'll be stunned until the end of our next turn. And with stunned, they can't move or take actions, they speak falteringly, and automatically fail both strength and dexterity saving throws. So, water whip, Fist of Unbroken Air, and a lot of our maneuvers would automatically succeed here. So, you know, if we could stun them on one round and then do our Nova round on round two, that of course could be super effective. The big challenge and drawback with Stunning Strike, of course, is that it targets what's generally the worst saving throw for us to be targeting in D&D 5e, Constitution. But if you can get it to stick, it's incredibly potent. No question. We also now at Monk 5 get to spend more key points to upcast our elemental disciplines. It's a pretty expensive thing to do, but yes, if we wanted now, we could spend three key points to do 4d10 damage with Water Whip. I'm not certain it's the best use of our key, honestly, but as always, I'm exploring the extent of what's possible, so I'm going to assume that we're spending three key points here when we crunch numbers just to see how far we can stretch things. Don't forget that our martial arts die scales up to a d6 now from a d4, meaning that our unarmed strikes will do a d6 of damage. Not amazing, but we'll take it. At level 9, though, I want to take just one more level of fighter to get that ability score increaser feat that's just waiting right there for us. So we can cap our dexterity here at 20 to really get the most out of our attacks and help ensure that our maneuvers do what we really want them to do. Not to mention bump our armor class as well. But for our level 9 damage report then, we've seen a lot of nice improvements since last check. First off, we've bumped our wisdom to better ensure that our water whip is effective, and now we've capped our dexterity modifier for our attacks and our maneuvers. We've added extra attack, we've raised the damage of our unarmed strikes a little bit, and potentially increased the damage from our water whip to 4d10 if we're willing to sacrifice the key for it. But tactically, things are pretty much the same. Combat starts, we run up to our target, knock them prone with water whip, doing some pretty good damage. We then action surge, take the attack action, hit them with our hammer twice now, then spend a key point to flurry of blows and make two unarmed strikes. We add a superiority die to all four of those attacks and as a result, end up doing, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saves, 80 damage on our Nova round. And versus an enemy with a 16 AC and a plus six to their saves, it's 71 damage. All right, we're hanging in there, kind of more like bottom half of tier three here compared to other Nova builds that I've done to date, but still beating those lowest performers. And you know, we're even bringing some new tools to the game here, like Stunning Strike potentially. But you know what I think we need at this point in our career? A little more variety, a little more versatility, maybe some support options, and perhaps most importantly, a little more elemental bending, so long as we flavor it right. Because yes, at level 10, it's time to take a third class, I think. Like barbarians and rogues, monks are one of those classes that really suffer from poor scaling, at least damage-wise. So at this point in their career, our hero feels compelled to learn more about these elemental powers that they've begun to unlock within themselves. Their martial training is in a great place, and they now need to know what is the true nature of these elemental forces and how they can learn to unleash their elemental and mystical power to greater extent. Whatever your reasons, we are taking druid levels now, primarily because we need to do something to take advantage of all of this amazing amazing forced enemy movement that we have, right? So, as a druid one, 
we would first up learn Druidic, which is the language that Druids have to leave signs for one another using sticks and leaves and piles of dirt. But then we do get Druid spells. And yeah, for first level spells, I think I'm taking probably Good Berry and Healing Word to give us some nice low level support capabilities to bolster our party. And anytime that I'm playing a character who can burst or Nova, especially if they're otherwise a little underpowered, I really love to have some support capabilities on them to make sure that we're still doing some nice things to help out our party and don't feel weak or kind of useless outside of our big burst round, right? Not that monks are totally worthless, but our damage is definitely not keeping up with characters who are built for sustained damage, right? Other spells to consider, you know, Fairy Fire or Entangle would both be good ones to consider using our concentration for here, I think, either for a nice debuff on our enemies or some potential control. As for cantrips, I really want to make sure that we get Thorn Whip here, which will act as sort of a poor man's water whip if we don't want to spend the key or we don't have the key points for that matter, but still want to be pulling enemies toward us. And I don't know why we couldn't reflavor Thorn Whip as maybe like a lasso of fire to add a little fire bending to our avatar here. At level 11, we would be a Druid 2, and that means we get Wild Shape, which is so much fun. We can use Wild Shape twice per short rest to transform into a beast of one quarter challenge rating or lower that does not have a flying or swimming speed. And we can stay in this form for a number of hours equal to half our druid level. When transformed, we can't cast spells, among other things, though we can concentrate on spells we cast before we shapeshift it. It's definitely a handy bit of utility to use for scouting or to get into places that you otherwise couldn't. That said, don't forget that you can expend a use of your wild shape to summon a familiar a la the Find Familiar spell. Now, unfortunately, when we do this, our familiar only lasts up to a number of hours equal to our druid level, but I'm still going to be assuming that this is what we're primarily using our wild shape for. And hey, we get our wild shape uses back on a short rest, so being able to summon a familiar twice per short rest that lasts for two hours each time we summon it makes me think we should have it available for pretty much every combat encounter most of the time at most tables. And that's going to be pretty fantastic to help us do some scouting as well as grant us advantage on one attack per turn just in case the enemy makes their initial save against our water whip and are not prone when we start whacking them. And of course, it will also be handy on subsequent non-Nova rounds, right? So long as we have our familiar take the help action, which they can do. We also at Druid to get our Druid subclass, our Druid Circle. And while admittedly we're mostly in Druid here for Druid spells and not really for any particular subclass feature, Wildfire Druid might be the most in line with the whole Master of Elements thing, but I'm actually going to recommend taking the Circle of Land here and picking the Coast option for my land type. Mostly because that allows us to learn the Misty Step spell, which is incredibly useful and not typically available to druids. And honestly, I wish that I had Misty Step on my Stars Druid that I'm playing in game in our Tales of Anaria game so bad. I'm even considering taking the Fey Touched feat just to get it. But, you know, being affiliated with the sea and the coast still fits pretty snugly in the whole waterbender thing that I've kind of got going right now, too. So, I think it's a nice fit thematically, even. Now, land druids do get to learn a bonus druid cantrip here, which is great. If you didn't take guidance before, I'd definitely grab it here. It's nice utility, letting you add a d4 to an ally's skill check, right? Or your own, for that matter. And then land druids also get natural recovery, which is fantastic. It lets us recover spent spell slots once per day with a short rest. The spell slots are equal to half our druid level rounded up, which is fantastic, just like the uh, wizard's arcane recovery here. We're not going to have a ton of spell slots on this character, so this is actually a really great feature for us. Now, at level 12, we're going to be a druid 3, and that means second level druid spells. If you went coastal circle of the land, then we get mirror image and misty step for free here. Other than that, for second level druid spells here, I want to grab Lesser Restoration to help cure your allies of their maladies, but there are two spells that I specifically want to focus on, both of which will likely see some use during combat for us. First up, 
Moonbeam. Moonbeam is one of those spells that I love, but I wish were just a little bit better. You cast it as an action, it requires your concentration, and then it fills a 10 foot diameter column with burning moonlight, which causes 2d10 damage both when an enemy starts their turn there and when they get moved into the spell's area of effect for the first time on a turn. And while the area is small, you can use an action on subsequent turns to move it, making it a little more useful. The spell damage scales exceptionally well, going up 1d10 for every level you upcast it. The other kind of downside to the spell is that enemies get to make a constitution save against it to take half damage, and like I've said, that's typically the worst saving throw for us to be targeting bad guys with in 5e. Still, they do take half damage even if they succeed, meaning the spell will still do decent damage regardless of whether they save or not, especially if we can cause damage twice per round from it. And yeah, we've built around this spell before, and have used lots of spells like it to double up on damage by moving enemies into the area of effect on our turn and then having them take damage again when they start their turn in the area of effect, right? You could absolutely do the same thing here with this build, as we've got a couple of nice ways to be moving enemies. But Speaking of moving enemies, the other spell, the second spell that I want to make sure we grab here for our Nova round especially, is, yes, Spike Growth. It fills a 20-foot radius circle, so 40 feet end-to-end, -end, right, with thorns and briars. And thereafter, that area becomes difficult terrain, and any creature moving through the area, yes, even if they're forced to move through it, takes 2d4 damage for every 5 feet they move. Also, enemies don't get to save against this damage. If they move or are moved, they take the damage, period. It also costs an action to cast and requires our concentration. So, which is the better spell to use, Moonbeam or Spike Growth? Numbers wise, it's going to be Spike Growth if you can take full advantage of the 25 feet of forced enemy movement that you get out of Water Whip. 25 feet is just so much movement, and it's the thing that's going to allow our elemental avatar to continue to scale damage-wise. The question is, is there going to be an enemy that you can actually drag 25 feet through the spell's area? Now, like I've said, it covers 40 feet end-to-end, -end, so there's a decent chance depending on the size of the broom and where you are in relation to the enemy, but of course it's not going to work perfectly every time. What's more, spike growth can be a great thing to throw down to slow and damage your enemies, but it can also potentially be pretty disruptive for your allies as well, especially if you have a lot of melee allies and you stick all the bad guys in the middle of the briar patch, right? So now your friends have to wade through the briar patch to get to them. And yeah, sometimes the area you're fighting in might be too small to to avoid making this a hazard for your entire team. For those reasons, I do think having Moonbeam as an option will be really important here, letting you pull out one or the other depending on the situation. Oh, and for what it's worth, if I were playing this character in-game, I would 100% reflavor these spells. Spike growth could very easily be made into like earth-bent spikes of rock, right? And I don't know why Moonbeam couldn't be an actual pillar of fire instead of Moonfire. So long as your DM is okay with it, do things to help keep the flavor and the concept of your character on point. But at level 13, now that we've got something to take advantage of our fantastic forced enemy movement, let's get a little more of it. I want another level of Monk here to really take our elemental bending powers to the next level. So we'd be a monk six, and thus we get key empowered strikes. First of all, this tells us that our monk weapons and our unarmed strikes are considered magical for the purpose of overcoming enemy resistance to non-magical weapon attacks. This will be nice when we're running into enemies with said resistance, especially if we don't have a magic weapon by this point, and you know, we don't have anything like insignia of the claws that allows our unarmed strikes to be magical. If you're running into that a lot and you need to take monk six sooner, go ahead. But then we also, as a way of the four elements monk at level six get to add a third elemental discipline and since we're adding a new one remember we can swap out one of our existing ones for a different one as well if it were me i would be getting rid of elemental attunement here and replacing it with fist of unbroken air which we've already talked about and then as for the new one that we add i think i'd probably go with clench of the north wind 
You have to be Monk 6 in order to qualify for it, and with it you can spend three, yes I know, ouch, key points to cast the Hold Person spell. It's not the greatest thing ever, but against humanoids it kinda is. Hold Person with your concentration will paralyze enemies who fail their wisdom save against it, and that's generally a pretty good saving throw to be targeting, meaning that against most humanoids it's going to be more likely to stick than Stunning Strike most of the time. Though, of course, it's also a lot more expensive. But it is situationally very powerful. But the best thing about having both the Fist of Unbroken Air and Water Whip now, of course, is that when we action surge during our Nova round, instead of just making a couple of extra Warhammer attacks against our enemy, we can pull them with Water Whip as our first action, dragging them across that spike growth. Then, since we spent key on our action, we can take advantage of key empowered strikes, make a bonus action weapon attack. Doing so would let us apply our Battle Master Maneuver pushing attack and shove them 15 feet back through the spiky growth. Then, action surge, and Fist of Unbroken Air do more damage and push them even further, 20 feet deeper into the spiky ground to land them 10 feet further away from us than when we started our turn, but also prone since that's what Fist of Unbroken Air does in addition to the push, remember? So yeah, we are now a true monkish cheese grater and it's pretty dang awesome. So for our level 13 damage report then, quite a bit has changed for us. Now, on round one, I'm going to assume that we are casting Spike Growth. It is a useful spell both to damage the enemy and create some nice battlefield control. So I don't really feel like this is any kind of wasted setup round at all. But round two is now when we go Nova. Like I've said, you cast Water Whip on an enemy. If you need to position yourself to put 25 to 30 feet between you and them, you've got 40 feet of move speed to do so. But then yes, they'll take 40, 10 damage from the Water Whip and assuming they fail their save, we'll take 25 damage on average being drugged 25 feet across spike growth towards you. You make a bonus action weapon attack, applying pushing attack, pushing them 15 feet back through spike growth. You should have advantage on that attack thanks to your familiar. Then yes, action surge, hit them with fist of unbroken air for another 4d10 damage and 20 more feet of move speed through the ouchy places. All told, if everything works, we would do 8d10 damage for our two elemental disciplines, 2d8 plus 7 for our single weapon attack, and then 30d4 for being drug back and forth over 60 feet worth of spike growth. And thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their dex and strength saves, we would on average do 104 damage. We broke the century mark. And against enemies with a 17 AC and a plus 7 to their saves, it would be 74 damage. And that is another really nice increase, both to the damage and the fun level. And yeah, let's be honest, how many times are you going to be running into enemies with a plus 7 to both their dexterity and their strength saving throws? Almost never. So I think you're more likely to be on the high end of this damage that we just discussed than the low. But regardless, compared to other Nova builds at this level, we're still hanging out pretty close to the bottom of tier 3, but not quite in last place. Not only that, but we've picked up some decent backup support and utility options as well thanks to those druid levels and spells. So coming down the home stretch, let's see if we can stick the landing. I think I just mixed up my sports metaphors there. All right, at level 14, with our very important wombo combo finally set up, I want to take one last level in druid here to get both another spell slot, but also to get that ability score increase or feat that's just right there. That means we can bump our wisdom score to cap it at 20, so we can really be doing all we can to ensure that the enemy fails against our water whip and our fist of unbroken air primarily. But of course, increasing our armor class, increasing the likelihood of stunning strike sticking, and adding a little to our healing doesn't hurt either. But at level 15, I want to end the build with, yes, a fourth class, if you can believe it, and if you and your DM can stomach it. It's definitely not necessary. I can see this character just going back to Monk for more utility and defensive features, as well as more key points, and even eventually the ability to spend more key points on our elemental disciplines to get a little more burst damage out of them. I could also see you just sticking with Druid here to just increase your spells, your spell levels, and just overall support and utility functionality of the character. But 
slave to the spreadsheet that I am, I want to find just one more way to stretch our burst damage as far as we can. And I think the answer can be found in the Ranger class. So that is where we're going to end the build today. Thus, we would be a Ranger 1, and that means we get Favored Foe, which lets us do a little bit of extra damage once per turn to an enemy, so long as we sacrifice our concentration for it. And I'm not going to assume that we're doing this unless we're out of spell slots. We would also get the Deft Explorer Canny feature, which essentially gives us expertise in one skill that we're proficient in, letting us double our proficiency bonus for that skill, right? I'm gonna say pick your favorite skill here. I'd probably plan on going perception, since perception checks are so often called for in most games, but stealth or acrobatics might be a good choice too. PYF. At level 16, we would be a ranger too, and that means we get another fighting style. And of all the options available to us, I think blind fighting would be my favorite. It could definitely come in handy against invisible enemies, or if we're otherwise fighting in the dark, or against heavily obscured enemies, etc. Perhaps more importantly though, for this build anyway, it feels like something that a monk, and especially a monk highly attuned to the element of air, would be like really good at. Detecting the subtle breathing of an enemy nearby, or the whistle of a weapon as it speeds towards us, right? We also get ranger spells here, and I'm also gonna say pick your favorites on these. There's nothing here that we're really going to want for our Nova round, and not really a lot that we'd want outside of that either that we didn't already have access to via our Druid spell. So pick up a Zephyr Strike or even a Hunter's Mark maybe if you think it would be worth using, especially if you were out of second level spell slots and wanted something for your concentration, right? But yeah, pick your favorites. But finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a Ranger 3. That means we get Primal Awareness first off, which basically gives us the Speak with Animals spell that we can cast once per day without spending a spell slot and with spell slots thereafter. Nice little bit of utility. But then most importantly, and the main reason that we're in Ranger in the first place is for the Ranger archetype, the subclass. And in case you hadn't guessed it yet, yes, we are going with Swarm Keeper. Now, how you would work Swarm Keeper into your character story and concept is up to you, of course. But if it were me, I think I would try to flavor this swarm that supposedly follows me around now and will like move creatures for me as either nothing more than me continuing to manipulate wind currents with my airbending techniques, or perhaps like a little swarm of tiny air elementals or something like that. Work it out with your DM, of course. But yes, swarm keepers are a ton of fun and I haven't used the subclass since my swarm keeper slingshot build that I did. Am I out of cards? Uh, that was quite a long time ago now. And we get a couple of features with swarm keeper. First up, swarm keeper magic. This basically lets us learn the mage hand cantrip, always useful. I'm not going to say always handy and you can't make me. As well as the fairy fire spell if we didn't already know it. But then the main thing that we're interested in, of course, is the Gathered Swarm feature, which tells us that once on our turn, immediately after we hit a creature with an attack, our swarm, or again, I think for me, this would be like an air whip or a gust of wind or a thunderclap or something, does an extra d6 of damage and can then force an enemy to make a strength save or be moved up to 15 feet horizontally in a direction of our choice. And honestly, this is just so good because at level 17, for our final damage report, this is what our Nova round would now look like. You get spike growth down and then you water whip and do damage, pulling them 25 feet towards you. You then action surge and attack with advantage, thanks to your familiar. On the first attack, you apply a trip attack, doing some extra damage and hopefully knocking them prone. On your second attack, you have advantage once again, and you apply pushing attack to the attack, pushing them 15 feet away from you back through the spiky ground. You immediately activate your swarm of air elementals or whatever for an extra d6 of damage and then move them, assuming they fail their saving throw, 15 feet back towards you for more spiky damage. You then use your bonus action to flurry of blows, making two unarmed strikes with more superiority dice maneuvers applied in damage. The final one being pushing attack again to push them, yes, another 15 feet away from you through the spiky growth. I mean, it is literally just back and forth and back and forth. 
and it would be so much dang fun to see this play out on the battlefield as you just grate that enemy into powder. If everything goes according to plan, you will be dragging this poor soul over 70 feet of spiky ground on a single turn. It's so great. And thus, against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saving throws, you would on average here do 149 damage. And against enemies with an 18 armor class and a plus eight to their saves, it would be 111. And even though we're having a blast and that's decent damage, it is still pretty near the bottom of tier three compared to other Nova builds that I've done to date at this level, but not the very bottom. And we are 100% living our best four elements avatar life. And we have no regrets. Okay, let's break it down in the final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take the damage that we calculate at all armor classes and saving throws across all four of the damage reports and just average them into one big number we come up with are you ready drum roll a 71 which is not last place nor second nor third but fourth to last place we did it <laughs> of course it kind of took everything i had to get us there and in the end of the day, we only ended up with six levels in Monk, right? You guys, you would not believe how long it took me <laughs> to come up with the final version of this build. I probably spent twice as many hours working on this one as I do for most of my builds. My first pass ended up one point of damage, one point of damage lower than everybody else on their final tier score. So I had to scrap that and go back to the drawing board and just rework a bunch of stuff, crunching numbers like a billion different times in a billion different ways. I'm exhausted. If nothing else, I think what we've really done here is show just how hard it is to get the way of the four elements monk to be even viable mechanically. No martial character should require this much work to get them to be competitive damage wise, in my opinion. And you know what? It really wouldn't take a lot to get the way of the four elements monk to be a lot more viable mechanically. So attention DMs, monk lovers, and those who want to play an avatar-like character from the world of The Last Airbender in D&D. Here are a couple of really easy and simple ways to bring the way of the four elements monk in line with other character classes, power-wise. First off, give the subclass more elemental disciplines. Instead of the two or the three or the four you can have with a very heavy level investment, double it. Or heck, I honestly don't think it would be particularly overpowered if you just gave Way of the Four Elements monks access to every single elemental discipline that's on the list. Keep the level prerequisites if you need to, sure, though those could be lowered a bit. It's not a huge list, and the other elemental disciplines that we could have taken aren't particularly powerful, and it's not like we have unlimited key points to spend on them anyway. But then, second off, those disciplines that scale should just scale automatically at certain levels in Monk without requiring additional key points to be spent. Monks have so few key as is. Don't tax these spells and spell-like abilities to the nth degree like this. It's criminal. Even if you tweaked the rules to allow for both of these things, the subclass would not even be close to overpowered. It still wouldn't even be the best monk subclass, I don't think, but it would be a lot more viable than it is today. But of course, we built this four elements avatar without those easy to implement buffs. And all things considered, I'm pretty dang happy with where we ended up. It definitely has a cool avatar-like feel, I think, which I'm most pleased with, and ended up doing respectable burst damage, as well as some decent enemy control options and even a smattering of support and utility, making them fairly well-rounded mechanically and just oozing with angish flavor. Mmm, <laughs> flavor of ang. Delicious. So yes, I would love to try out this character in game sometime, and I hope that you get to as well, because that's the build for the week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you know how much I love you. Thank you so much for all that you do for the channel. Please like and subscribe and comment if you haven't already done so. Consider joining the channel as a member if you really want to go the extra mile. But above all, I hope that you will stay safe and be good and kind and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care.
La, da, da, da. La, da, da. La da 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 It kind of seems like a monkish tune, right? Something that you might find a monk up on a mountaintop just piping on their pan flute. That's an Enya song, by the way, in case you didn't know. I don't know how to pronounce the name of it. It's called, like, Smaunte. <laughs> Gaelic speakers, help me out. Last track on Shepherd Moons. Anybody? Man, it is raining. In the middle of the winter, it should be snowing. Why is it raining? The elements must be attuning to my water bending today. Or maybe just arrows? Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> don't even say that. I don't have time. No, don't even say that. Well, actually, don't even say that. Uh, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Better look that up. Uh, I think that's true. Not quite sure. Yeah. Okay, don't say that. Well, don't say that. Well, don't even say that. Well, yeah, don't even say that. So don't even say that. Or maybe just arrows? It's still not working. <laughs>